Welcome. It's really great to have so many of our alumni and friends joining us today. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, you joining us from all over the world and thank you for taking the time for this uh, wonderful conversation, very interesting conversation with Imperial experts. These are such unprecedented times. Uh, we've had so much illness, suffering and death. We really hope that all of our friends and alumni are staying safe. And we really look forward to sharing some of our experts' insights on COVID-19 and how it is evolving and being treated in 2021. Imperial College London has been remarkable throughout the pandemic, not only understanding, modeling, and treating the disease, or as our colleagues will discuss today, but also producing leading new testing technologies an exciting new self-amplifying RNA vaccine platform, and myriad innovations and discoveries that are helping people, communities, and society. The headlines of this past week have been disturbing. There's news that the new variant may be more lethal, concerns that some variants may render vaccines less effective. This is a very opportune time to have this discussion and I want to get on with it by first introducing my wonderful colleagues. First, our expert in respiratory medicine and immunology, Professor Peter Openshaw, who is studying the clinical behavior of the virus and co-leads the ISERIC 4C collaboration, bringing together immunology, clinical characterization, and diagnostics. He can help us look at the pathology, immune response and treatment options available today. We will then turn to Professor Stephen Riley, Professor of Infectious Disease Dynamics, who combines field studies with mathematical model models to look at the transmission of different strains of respiratory infections and their transmission in rural and urban settings. He is part of the REACT study, Real-Time Assessment of Community Transmission and as we look at these new variants, this is a very important study that Stephen can help us uh, understand how they're emerging and growing. Finally, our world leading virologist, Professor Wendy Barkley, who is an expert in pathogenesis, transmissibility, viral mutations and vaccines. She has just been chosen to lead Genotype to Phenotype UK National Virology Consortium. And she will help us understand what we know about this virus and the variants emerging and yet to emerge. So let's begin with Peter and talk about the disease, its phases, and how we can treat this disease. Peter? Well, thank you so much, Alice. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you today um, and to just run through very briefly some of the things which are most in people's minds. Now, I am wondering if uh, that has succeeded in showing my slides properly. Can you, is that, can you see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I will try to be very brief because I think what we really want to do is to have a, a vibrant discussion. And I'm sure many of you have become to some degree expert in all things COVID by now, and you will have many questions that you would you would like to ask. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, to, to say was that this is a disease that goes in different phases. And um, let me just get my pointer here. So the, the early phase um, is during viral replication. We have a, a virus driven phase of disease which often presents as a cough, um, sometimes with, uh, with flu-like components. And then there may be a sort of intermission in the progress of the disease. And then it returns later with a vengeance in some people and leads to respiratory failure. And also these very, very bizarre complications of inflammation in the blood vessels and, um, and clotting responses. Um, and it's in this complicated later stage of disease that some people unfortunately do die. So it's, I think we need to think about these different phases in trying to understand how the 
how the treatments might work. And I wanted to bring a slightly positive message about the fact that treatments do work um, and that we're getting better at treating this disease over time. Uh, this is some mortality data from the ISRIC 4C study that Alice kindly mentioned at the beginning. This is a wonderful UK-wide collaboration which um, really grew out of what we learned during the influenza pandemic in 2009, that we need to have large-scale studies that we can roll out nationally if we're going to learn things during a, another pandemic. This um, shows the mortality falling from about 30% of hospitalized patients in the initial stage down to around 12% currently. So that's a really big drop in hospital mortality. And I was going to first just give a few thoughts about why we might have seen that reduction. And I think probably there is no single answer. There are many different things, all of which we're doing slightly better, you know, better nursing care, better physiotherapy, but there is also uh, better medical treatment. We were doing a lot of things in the early stages, which probably were not helping and which may therefore have been causing harm. And I think stopping doing things which are harmful is every bit as important as doing things which are beneficial. So this is something which is beneficial, which is straightforward, old fashioned steroid dexamethasone. It doesn't seem to matter whether it's dexamethasone or another steroid, but if that's given to people um, in the stage when they're developing low oxygen levels, and particularly if they're on mechanical ventilation, it causes a remarkable reduction in mortality. And this was um, established in a trial that actually surprised me. Um, this was a trial from our colleague run from Oxford, um, and it really did show for the first time and definitively that steroids were a good thing, but you had to get the phase of disease right. You have to wait until people have low oxygen levels. Now, this is another study which reported relatively recently. Um, this is the REMAP-CAP study. It's uh, an international consortium, and um, our own Professor Tony Gordon leads this study for the UK um, here at um, Imperial College. And they tried um, some interventions which block uh, something called interleukin-6. This is something which uh, can be found in the blood and which is an immunological mediator of inflammation. And they showed that if you block um, interleukin-6, you can have an improvement in survival, um, a reduction in time in intensive care, and a reduction in time in hospital. So on three different measures, two different blockers of IL-6 um, are beneficial. So <clears throat> a second immunological intervention that, that helps. <clears throat> So what about vaccines? Another immunological um, maneuver, but this time a prophylactic one. In other words, one that prevents disease from developing in the first place, which is really where we should be spending our effort. So the UK um, set up something called the Vaccine Task Force, which got ahead of the curve and pre-commissioned 345 million doses. So considering that our population is only 65 million or so, um, that's a lot of vaccine that was pre-commissioned. And this was done because we really didn't know which of these vaccines might succeed and which might fail, which might be partially effective. So we just spent a lot of money on commissioning a lot of vaccine up front. And we now have three vaccines which have been given emergency approval in the UK, one from Oxford AstraZeneca, um, one from BioNTech Pfizer, and one from Moderna. So three different vaccines are now being rolled out in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so there are many, many interesting things about the vaccine landscape. It's exciting as an immunologist to see such a fast rollout of vaccines um, and the plethora of vaccines being offered by different companies. Um, this graphic on the, on the right here shows the big differences in the price of these different vaccines. So the Oxford AZ vaccine is priced low. That was an agreement that AZ signed up to um, in order to promote the mission that Oxford had 
committed to, which is to make the vaccine as cheap as possible so it could be used as widely as possible. Um, the Moderna vaccine, a, a US RNA vaccine, is actually the highest price. Um, and we all, and you can see the Pfizer-BioNTech here is a sort of mid-priced vaccine. Um, but the price that is paid in different parts of the world is not always the same. I think the other thing to point out this graphic on the left is a huge differential in terms of how much money has been poured into these vaccines. And you can see that the AZ vaccine has had a massive investment. You know, if you add up the investment made in, you know, the top four other vaccines, that's exceeded by the investment made by AZ in producing this vaccine based on a chimpanzee adenovirus, which has been genetically disabled. So what sort of results have we seen from the trials of these vaccines? So we think in terms of, um, of curves of disease here um, over time since the first dose. And you can see that the recipients of this particular vaccine, this is the BioNTech RNA vaccine, essentially stop getting infections from about <clears throat> day 12. So this is an enlarged part of the graphic showing that, you know, after about day 12 to 14, there's effectively very, very little by way of infection in the vaccinated group, whereas the control group goes onwards and upwards. So a remarkable effect, similar to that seen in the Moderna trial. I guess the chimpanzee adeno from Oxford is not quite so effective, but it's the same sort of pattern. So uh, how are we doing in terms of vaccine rollout? Um, I've omitted from this graph Israel um, and Bahrain because they are way up here, but of the larger countries, um, the UK has actually managed to get ahead because of the vaccine task force and has been producing, you know, has been injecting a lot of people partly accelerated by our decision to delay the second dose. So this is people who've had the first dose, and you can see that we're really pulling ahead on the basis that we are waiting 12 weeks now for the second dose. Uh, I think the other thing which is good in the UK is that we've got a lot of public confidence in vaccines. And I think there are many reasons for this, um, but I think you know, this is something else which is really in our favor that you know, over 70% of people say that they would have the vaccine if it was available. And I think that um, you know, it, this is, this is um, a, quite an achievement to have managed to get public confidence up to this sort of level. Um, so just reflecting towards the end on you know, whether we were right to, uh, uh, to decide to delay the second dose, this is not a licensed delay based on trials but is based on immunological advice. Um, this is actually the, one of the journals that immunologists um, like is immunity. It's an immunologist's immunology journal. And back in 2010, this review from some of the world's key leaders in immunological memory pointing out that if you try to dose too soon with a booster, you can actually kill off the response. Um, and in this particular review, they recommend two to three months between the prime and the boost. So it's based on good, solid immunology that we knew before the pandemic. And I think we just need to do the, the studies to, to find out whether this uh, decision that we've made, a slightly eccentric decision in, in global terms, has been the right one. So to, to conclude, I mean, we're world leaders, not only in COVID deaths, very, very sadly, but also in vaccine rollout. Um, there have been some great studies done in the UK, and these studies are important in showing which immunological therapies work at what phase of the disease, and very importantly, what doesn't work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. We've got some questions uh, from some of our audience. We've heard about 70% uh, effective, 95% effective. Can you briefly explain what the efficacy is from both the population and a individual point of view. And then there were questions about this question of delaying the second dose, but maybe we can get into some more immunological questions. Yes. So I think the, the, the percentage um, efficacy in these studies depends so much on 
the time point that people choose. I mean, obviously, if you include the first um, two weeks, during which time there's very little protection, and then you only extend to one more week, then you're going to get very little efficacy because the curve only flattens during that last week. So some of the lower, um, the, the lower numbers come from that sort of analysis. Um, I mean, the, it also depends on whether you look at studies which are just done in the UK or whether you include the studies which are done in South America. There's all sorts of ways of coming up with these different figures. I think, you know, to me, the headline is that these are remarkably effective vaccines, you know, almost extraordinary in just how effective they are. But there are other vaccines which um, have gone through to field trials and which have actually been proven not to be very effective and have now been dropped. So it's not just that everything works, but these three in particular seem to work remarkably well. And I think there may be other vaccines reporting in the next few weeks, which will also show remarkably good efficacy. So we're very, very fortunate to have vaccines that really do work. That's good. That's good to have some uh, good news. Uh, there's a question from the audience uh, about how the antibodies from uh, being infected differ or are the same as those you have from a vaccination and, and why do they decrease over time? Yes. Okay. So there's been a lot of debate about waning immunity. The, the virus is not a passive participant in the immune response. As soon as the virus gets in, it starts to synthesize non-structural proteins that interfere particularly with the, uh, with the immediate immune response that um, potentially could throw the virus out before it ever gets a, gets a stronghold. Um, so um, the virus can actually weaken the immune system at the same time as succeeding in replication, whereas a vaccine is just uh, designed in order to stimulate an immune response and may actually stimulate a better immune response than the virus itself. And particularly with some of the modern techniques of vaccine design uh, with excellent adjuvants, as we call them, things which make the vaccine even stronger. Um, and these RNA vaccines, you know, they, they just turn up the immune system rather than allowing it to be turned down. So. You know, it's, there's some really interesting immunology going on uh, that underpins these uh, fantastic vaccine effects. Thank you. Well, I'm, there's so many things to uh, turn to, and uh, I'd like to turn to Stephen. We'll be coming back to you. Uh, I have questions about uh, drug therapies as well as long COVID. Uh, but Stephen, um, you've been uh, involved with the REACT study. You're watching how the disease is progressing. Um, can you uh, give us some update on what you're seeing on the epidemiology? Yeah, thanks, Alice. I think I'll, I'll share some slides from the results that came out today, if that's OK. Um, so let me put those up. Are they, have they gone up OK? I think so. Um, and with, with apologies, perhaps, to our international kind of alumni and friends today, this is going to be a little bit England focused. It's even, even less than the UK, but it's um, uh, I'm going to show some results from a large um, uh, uh, prevalence study, a, a kind of swab prevalence study that we've been running now since May last year. This is uh, um, this is in collaboration with uh, Wendy and a number of others from around uh, the university. I mentioned Paul Elliott in particular, um, who's, uh, who's who's taking a very uh, prominent role in all this work, and Ara Darzi as well, whom some of you may know. Um, and what would doing, and like before I get into detail, that um, the, the government and, you know, and, and the scientific community has to track the, the epidemic in lots of different ways. We have the hospitalization data, we have case data, you know, Peter's mentioned the, the very high number of deaths we've experienced. We can see signals of the epidemic in all these different data types, but it was recognized very early on that there may be an advantage to directly trying to measure the virus in the community. There aren't that many examples around the world of, of this being attempted. In the UK, in, in England, we're doing it with a REACT study and also with another, another study, ONS. And the idea is you get quicker insight, you get a better signal or a more useful signal about what's happening kind of over short periods of time that can basically kickstart policy formulation so people can start thinking about what they need to do next because they know what's happening a little bit earlier. We think we've been reasonably successful in helping in that way. And I'll, I'll just very quickly go through kind of today's results 
um, which which went out first thing this morning. Um, it's React is, as I said, it's a snapshot. Um, we're in the eighth round now. We repeatedly survey um, the, a cross section of the population. In the UK is divided up into about just over 300 local areas, and we've designed it to get about the same number of samples from each local area. Um, that ends up at between 120 and 180,000 people taking part in a single round. And this lets us do things like estimate the R number, which is a, a measure of how fast the epidemic's growing or shrinking. And we can look at kind of other aspects of the epidemic as well. To date, we've over 1.3 million across the eight rounds, 1.3 million people across the eight rounds have participated in, in React One. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're really pleased and proud of, of this is this is kind of um, citizen science as well as as hopefully really good helpful epidemiology. Um, and it, this, these are the these are the kind of 1.3 million people broken down into all the different rounds. Um, and today's results are at the very bottom there. Um, and it's you know it's not good news in lots of ways because we're, we've observed the highest prevalence that we've seen at kind of one point nearly 1.6% of people chosen at random in the UK are testing positive in this latest round. Um, but we, actually, we know from the period during Christmas, when, during Christmas when we weren't in the field, it's probably come down a little bit. So even though it's a very high level, it probably has come down a little bit in, in England since the Christmas period. And then we do lots of different things with it. But one of the one of the outputs that kind of gets the, the most attention is just trying to track the trend. So the left hand side here shows the, the kind of raw data, if you like. Those are all the days where we had a sample shown with those black points. The vertical bars show how confident we are on, on those days. So where we've got lots of samples, those vertical bars are kind of uh, smaller. And what you can see is it's if you take the period across just the average, um, then you get this slightly declining line, but you can't be sure if it's going up or down. Um, and what you'd really like at this stage in England, given the very high numbers of people going into hospital, we would really have wanted this to be going down more steeply than that. So it's um, uh, it's it's not terrible news, but it's we would have hoped for kind of a, just a steeper line on the left. We also detect there's something that's not quite linear in that. Um, so we also kind of fit what's called a spline, what's our best smooth trend going through there and there's a little bit better news in that because we see in the last six days up to, up to January the 22nd um, the, the data on the right of that dotted line are the very recent data we reported today there is a bit of a sign of a downturn but that's that's quite uncertain um, we are unfortunately at the moment because there's so much virus around we are powered to look at the different regions of England um, so here's the nine different regions that similar analysis shown for those and you can see that even though there's an average, there is uh, on average there is a kind of positive downturn. It is quite heterogeneous. So in some regions we get actually some evidence that it's still increasing, um, such as East Midlands, and then in the southwest, um, better evidence that it's decreasing. So we are kind of powered to disentangle that a little bit. And these are you know people are very interested in using these alongside the case data to try and get a picture of what's going on. Um, I, I won't spend too much detail on this slide but this is and, and again this is probably for the people watching from England today these results are not immediately consistent with the case data um, if you look at the raw case data then that's going down much more quickly what we've done here is we've compared our results not to the raw case data but to the proportion of people getting tested in the in the government surveillance system um, who are positive it's called uh, PCR positivity um, and it, what we see is there are the, the trends and the features on these curves are, are, are more consistent with the regional patterns that we're finding in React. So it's a, this is a very active debate today, is whether these population studies are giving a, a better picture of a, of a gradual decline or a plateau versus the case data. This slide suggesting that, that there is something going on in the testing that maybe the community prevalence studies are, are getting a bit more of, a, of an accurate signal. Um, and you know we, we look at other data sources as well. So this is this is movement from people who use a Facebook app on their mobile phone. Um, it's shown over the, the entire period of the pandemic, or from uh, the period of, during which we've had lockdowns in the UK. Um, and this lets us just kind of look at the levels of activity that are going on during the different times. And what we can see here is that 
during lockdown one, we got to very, very low levels of activity. Um, the second lockdown in the UK did produce a reduction in activity. It was nowhere near the same as the first lockdown. And then in, in this third most recent lockdown here, over here in January, we can see that the activity level is quite a bit lower than we saw in, in November, which is really encouraging, um, but still quite a bit higher than we achieved. So the, the way we're uh, interpreting this is that if, if it's not going down as steeply as we might want, it's maybe not unexpected when you look at how people are moving around. Um, so I won't go through all these bullets and there are some some prompts for questions so we can we can move on and keep the discussion going. Um, but I thought that would be even even for people not from the UK, that might be a nice example of the, the type of um, what we're trying to do is really good science on a much faster time scale that we hope is, is directly useful and, and gives people actually making the decisions a bit more of a heads up and clarity a bit sooner than they might otherwise have it. So thank you, Stephen. You mentioned, um, you know, uh, Peter showed us that the vaccine's being rolled out very rapidly. We're doing a, a good job uh, with it, but you mentioned that uh, it will have a limited impact on short-term trends. What are you seeing? What, what kind of, uh, how, how long <laughs> is it going to take for us to pull out of this current uh, situation and, and start to be able to move around a bit more freely? So I think it's, that's going to happen in two phases. Uh, you know, the, the UK is is doing a, a very good job of rapidly vaccinating those most at risk. Um, so we've got, you know, we've, we've done a high proportion of the over 80s, we're moving down to 70 and older. That should feed through soon to reduced hospitalizations and take the pressure off the health system. But it's not going to make a big difference on overall transmission, which is, which is the thing we measure here. But we would hope in, you know, a, a few weeks and certainly a, 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 within a couple of months, reducing the, the, the severity of disease with the vaccine and the at-risk will, will feed through to hospitalizations and to deaths. And then as, you know, as people have been discussing um, this week, the degree to which the vaccines block transmission is, is more difficult to tell. So, but if, they, if the vaccines are transmission blocking, once we get into those lower, more, uh, more kind of active ages, and then we might start to see kind of a genuine population immunity, but it's, it's two phases. Um, and the thing we really need is very, very high coverage in, in, in the most at risk. So let's, we want to stop at 80%, we want 90 or 95%. Well, thank you. And that's, uh, that was a question actually people um, had mentioned. Maybe you can stop sharing your screen and we can see you again a bit better. Um, that uh, the, the whether when you've been vaccinated, you can still transmit it, you know, how do we really stop this spread? Yeah, that's, so I think most, and um, I'd be interested, you know, Peter and, and Wendy might want to jump in on this as well. I think most people believe um, that the efficacy against disease is so good, there should be some aspects of transmission blocking, um, but the, the degree is really not clear. Um, the, the little bit of data that's available for the for the Oxford AZ vaccine is is certainly not conclusive on that. Um, we will try and have a look at that, but it's it's a difficult it's a difficult kind of estimate, and there's there's a lot of interest from around the world in that. And can I ask, with your uh, React study, and you're sending these, and and people are are responding, um, how how many what fraction people send it back and are you seeing the new variants i think we um, um are you watching for uh, the, the genetics of these yeah so um we 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 get what we think is incredibly high response rate but it might not sound that so we get between 20 and 30 percent response rate but that's for this kind of study that's from the people who receive a letter a letter lands on their doorstep to us getting a tested swab and then we're getting somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, which is is actually incredibly high, um, you know, given what we're we're asking of these people, um, but not as high as we would like. So any anyone on, uh, watching today who does receive that letter, please please do take part. Um, and then I'm sorry, Alex, just remind me of your of the second part of the question. And the variants, whether you're seeing what's uh, is this? Can yeah, you we. See that? We've not, um, as of yet, we don't have data on which positives are variant and which aren't. In a, in a just over a week or so, we should get uh, sequence data for many of the positives in round eight. So we'll be able to look um, not, not just for particular variants, but we should be able to kind of scan this representative sample for, for all the different mutations. So we're not able to do it now, but we're moving into that. 
Okay, but that was, uh, you know, I think you saw the bigger compliance in this recent lockdown and there was a lot of concern about the new variant and its ability to spread. So, um, and maybe we can turn to Wendy and, and talk a little bit about those variants and, and what we know and, and what she's seeing in the virology. Yes, thank you very much, Alice. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. I'm hoping this one is going to be the one. Let's share. Okay. And then hoping you can see yes. some pictures of viruses. Yes. Okay, so um, what I'm sharing on my screen now is the culprit. Uh, let me just switch on my pointer so I can point it out to you. So this round ball here and this one and this one, that's SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is a, an electron micrograph which landed on my desk this evening, so I thought I would share it. Um, and it shows, you know, this tiny indescript little ball uh, with these fuzzy blobs around the edge, which are the spike. Uh, this whole thing, if you look down here across the bar, is about 100 nanometers across, which is why we use an electron microscope to see it, which means you can get about 100,000 of those across your fingernail. Uh, and probably, you know, 10 of them is enough to infect you and result in the devastation that we see. So these particular pictures are indeed the UK variant, which is known as B117. And these other larger moieties you can see around are um, pieces of cell. These, this virus we've grown in the laboratory here in our containment level three laboratories that we are very lucky to have at Imperial College that enable us to, to, to do this work safely. And we grow these viruses in primary cell cultures of human airway. So this is more or less exactly as the virus would look as it was hanging around in your nose and throat, waiting to be breathed out to infect the next person. Um, okay, and the problem that we have at the moment is that this virus emerged, of course, from an animal reservoir just over a year ago and found its way into a, a naive population of 7 billion people around the world um, and spread incredibly quickly. Um, and for a while, uh, stayed relatively evolutionary static, but now we can see that the virus is mutating. We can see the virus is mutating because the world, and in particular the UK, are sequencing this virus in an unprecedented manner. There are hundreds of thousands of genome sequences of, of viruses collected from all around the world on the database. Around 40% of those are actually from the UK. The UK has a consortium known as COG UK, which are sequencing on, on average about five to 10% of our, our viruses. So we can watch all these mutations, uh, but we are at a point now where we can see the viruses mutating a lot. And the question we have is, well, do these mutations have any consequence or are they just there and riding along as the virus is increasing at the number of times it replicates, mutations occur and they get carried through? Or do these mutations have an effect, and in particular effects that we need to worry about? So the most obvious point to worry about at the moment is, as we've heard, we're relying really on vaccines as a way out of this. And if the virus mutates in a way that the vaccines are no longer a good match for the circulating viruses, because the vaccines are all based on sequences of viruses that were isolated more than a year ago now, then, then we may reach a point where the current vaccines as they stand work less effectively than we'd like them to. But there are other changes that may happen as the virus mutates as well. The, the transmissibility of the virus might change, the disease it causes, the severity, the, the case fatality rate, for example, um, and also other treatment options such as drugs, particularly antiviral drugs if we use them. There's a whole new era of monoclonal antibody therapies which are being given to people. And these are particularly susceptible to mutations. Um, and then another thing we need to worry about is whether or not the virus which crossed over from one animal species into humans and clearly can spread well between us, might it spread back into other animals? 
um, and cause problems perhaps for our domesticated farm animals, which could affect food supplies as, as well as causing health problems. So this is a worrying time. It's a critical time because the virus is mutating. We can watch that. And we are at a point where the level of immunity in humans, at least, is such that we could imagine we might drive selection of variants as they randomly appear as the virus replicates. So um, to that end, we are, we are intensely studying what's known as the genotype to phenotype relationship. How do we translate these mutations into understanding what, what, what phenotype, what difference they cause? So this is a very detailed slide, um, just to really show you the, the level of depth and knowledge that we're now accumulating about this virus. So on the left hand side is the cartoon, which basically illustrates the virus particle binding to its receptor like a lock and key, and then in entering the cell or injecting its genetic material into the cell it's infecting. But these little um, sort of spikes that are on the outside of the, the virus, uh, we now know, of course, that, that three in, in, in intense detail, what the three dimensional structure of those spikes look like, and that this this molecule here colored in, in green and pink and blue. And then here in yellow at the top is the ACE2 receptor. And you can see this close interaction between uh, one par part of the spike known as the receptor binding domain and the ACE2 protein. And on these different diagrams around the edge here are marked in red points on the spike protein that we are watching now, because those are the points where the virus is mutating. And in particular here, you can see red dots right at the interface of the spikes receptor binding domain with the ACE2 receptor. And these are, these are the key ones for causing the changes which we're worrying about. So the first of these variants which came into the headlines about two months ago now was the Danish mink virus. And you may remember that uh, what had happened was that, that people working in the farms uh, in Denmark and also Netherlands and the United States and other parts of the world where these animals are farmed, the people who have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 and gone to work had passed their virus to the animals and then the virus had passed red, very readily between the animals and had mutated in a way that um, adapted it to mink. But also these animals passed the virus back into other farm workers who then took it home and they were now spreading uh, mink adapted viruses in the local Danish community. And there was a real worry of one of an early report that one of these mink viruses was actually evading antibodies and was less well neutralized by serum for, by blood taken from people who'd recovered from earlier SARS infections. Um, so intense uh, research has now revealed uh, that those very mutations, as I said, sit like these red balls right at the interface between the spike protein and the ACE2. And it turns out that the exact sequence of the mink ACE2 receptor is different in a couple of places than the human ACE2. And so what was happening was that the virus was evolving and learning to bind better to the mink version of this ACE2 receptor, sort of, sort of honing in its ability to, to infect the mink. Now, luckily for us, what that appears to have done is to decrease its ability to bind to human ACE2. And also this virus, this mink virus didn't really affect any antibody recognition. And so since that time, when this virus was first reported, it's now faded away. The variant is not circulating in Denmark uh, anymore. Uh, the Danish mink were all culled in November. That was a decision made by the, the Danish government. Uh, and this virus um, is not spreading in the human community and now the reservoir in the mink is gone, that, that has gone away. However, um, unfortunately, there are some other variants which have emerged in the meanwhile, who, which have not gone away and quite the opposite have increased and, and are beginning to be dominant in various parts of the world. One of the first of these to be described is, is the UK variant, the picture I showed you at the start, it's known as B1.1.7. Uh, and we can trace uh, its growth um, through the lighthouse labs, which are the, the way that we are detecting in the test and trace system in the UK, our CoV-2 cases, SARS-CoV-2 cases. And you can see that this variant must have arisen or emerged sometime in the autumn. But by, by now, it is the vast majority of virus that, that is causing SARS-CoV-2 infections in the UK. And there's a particular feature which enables us uh, during, the, during the diagnostic procedure to, to tell 
this S dropout is a, is a hallmark of the virus in the diagnostics that we can tell where it is. Now, there is a lot of concern about this particular variant. Um, it's a curious virus. There are a lot of mutations in it, and it isn't completely clear where they all came from. They appeared almost all at once. There are 22 different coding mutations across the genome of the virus, and there is some feeling that maybe uh, the, the acquisition of so many mutations at once mean that this virus emerged during a long-term infection in a single individual who was probably immunocompromised and didn't manage to clear the virus in the first place. Some of these mutations increase the ability of the virus to bind to that important receptor and therefore almost certainly make it easier for the virus to enter cells when it finds itself in our noses and throats. And that's almost certainly why it's spreading better from person to person, about one and a half times better than the previous versions. And this is increasing the ability of the virus to infect a wider group of people, for example, children and younger adults are more susceptible to this virus than the first one that emerged and may result in an increased death rate as well, which is something which is under intense investigation at the moment. Luckily, there's a very, very small effect on antibody recognition, and this is unlikely to affect the ability of the vaccines that we're currently using to protect us against this variant. However, um, there are other viruses emerging. We're doing intense research to understand why variants like B117 might spread more rapidly. We know this virus is airborne. Is it that the virus is surviving longer in the air? Is it that there's more virus coming out from a person? Or is it that there's less virus needed to enter an individual to spark the infection in the first place? It could also be that if a larger number of asymptomatic people get infected with the virus, then, it, then the virus is more difficult to track down. Uh, and then they can pass their virus on to others. Uh, so when, we, when, when a virus doesn't cause disease, it can be even more difficult to control than, than um, when it does. And if there is a larger number of people with asymptomatic infection, that, that could also contribute to what we're seeing. So, uh, unfortunately, meanwhile, there are other variants emerging in other parts of the world. South Africa was very badly hit in the first wave. Around about 40% of individuals in certain parts of, of the country um, including a, a, an area called Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, were infected then. And it seems that uh, that may have uh, promoted, if you like, the spread of a particular variant, which is now spreading and predominating rather like the UK. Uh, in South Africa, this particular yellow virus is now by far the predominant virus. Uh, and in, in addition, we have a Brazilian variant, uh, which appears to have emerged in, in places like Manaus, Again, Manaus is a, is a, a city in, in Brazil which experienced a very intense first wave, almost reaching herd immunity in the first wave. And so there was a selection pressure perhaps uh, to select for variants of the virus which could overcome at least some level of naturally acquired immunity. So these three variants are in Janu today, in January 2021, causing us co some concern. You can see we know, of course, the sequences. We're trying to unravel which of these mutations that are, that are scattered across the genome of the virus are really the, the, causing these, these changes, possibly, possibly the ability of viruses to, to spread in populations with some level of pre-existing immunity. And as a remarkable, those of you with eagle eyes will, will spot some of these numbers are common between the different variants, even though they've origin, originated completely independently in different parts of the world. And that's the virus telling us that these combinations of these three different changes in spike, when they come together, are giving the virus a remarkable ability to, to be a, a more efficient human pathogen than it was when it first emerged from animals. And I'm going to finish uh, on this slide here. You've seen this picture on the left from Peter already um, about the huge success, really, of the mRNA vaccines and even after a single dose evidence of, of some level of protection against disease. And here on the left is some of the data out this week from our lab and in collaboration with um, the Imperial College Healthcare Trust colleagues, uh, where we're collecting sera from people who've received this Pfizer vaccine now as healthcare workers. And we can watch to see the emergence of antibodies in their blood 21 days after they got vaccinated. You can see that people who've never seen any virus before all make a good response and cross the line and have antibodies now that neutralize the, the virus. 
And then people who've seen the virus before and start off with a little bit of antibody, when they get their single dose of Pfizer vaccine, they have a huge boost, which is exactly what we'd expect from immunology textbooks, but it's incredibly reassuring to see. Now, these, these tests here are done with, with the old virus. So this is telling us that the, the vaccine will protect against the, the virus that, that we the vaccine was made to protect against. But of course, I showed you that we're now growing the variant virus in our labs. <clears throat> and what we'll be doing next is testing whether these vaccines here will protect against the new variants. So I'll finish there, stop sharing my screen, hopefully, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. I, I, it was notable that uh, some of the same mutations are happening in different parts of the world. I'm wondering, you know, do these uh, mutations happen? How many mutations happen in a coronavirus? And, and then we see certain ones that are selected for their transmissibility or what? And, and you know, is closing your borders uh, effective or, or are we going to get similar mutations in different parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the virus is mutating randomly all the time. And that's, you know, we can see thousands of mutations across the genomes. They're, 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 they've got mutations all over the place, but many of those are coming along as, as carriers, along with the key ones that are actually making the important changes. And so what, what we've got with this convergent evolution, with this, this three amino acids in spike at the moment, is really telling us that, that those three are like a winning combination for the virus. It's kind of rolled that, that dice in three different parts of the world and that's what's coming up trumps for it. So, you know, it's very powerful evidence that those three are making a difference when, when they're combined together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we expect this to, to carry on happening, but uh, the important, important key here is what, what uh, can we do about it? Well, you've, you've studied influenza quite a bit, and uh, many of us routinely take a flu jab every year. Um, is that what you foresee? And you make a new flu jab every year. I don't know quite how you decide what variations or variants of influenza to choose. Will there be a similar process for coronavirus? And, and how will they choose the jab yeah, next? That's, that's exactly what we're working on at the moment, talking to colleagues at World Health Organization, who, who, who take the responsibility every year to select influenza variants. And I foresee a, a very similar process where there'll be a huge worldwide collaboration. People will survey the virus and sequence it. We will measure how antigenically different all the viruses are from each other. Uh, and we'll, we will predict which viruses we think will be emerging next winter and, and update our vaccines on an annual basis. And I think one of the good news stories about the, the vaccines and the rush to make new vaccines and, and get them out is that we're using vaccine platforms now with these mRNA vaccines in particular, which are so agile that the updating of vaccines to accommodate new variant sequences will be much more easy than it's ever been for the influenza uh, vaccine technology, which relies on growing things in eggs and, and doing very sort of, sort of almost back, back in the dark ages, vaccinology. So we really, vaccinology has moved you know, 10 years in, in 10 months. And I think it's a good time because I suspect that other pathogens can equally be, be um, sort of dealt with by these technologies as well. Thank you. And, and there are several questions about the vaccine, um, uh, whether there's progress on a vaccine for children. And I don't know if Peter wants to talk about the decision to target the elderly and not the 18 to 24 year olds. And now the new decision in Germany to look at under 65 year olds. Um, and also a question about whether trials have focused on any ethnic, um, ethnic backgrounds because a concern that they don't always cover different ethnicities for safety and efficacy. Yeah, shall I, shall I try and respond to those? So the, the policy decision that was taken in the UK was to try to initially use the vaccines just to reduce the, the death rate. And we know that the death rate is really directly related to age. And therefore, we prioritized vaccination of the most vulnerable older adults and their carers. And then we have a series of tiers through which we work down. Um, there are nine tiers. And we're hoping to get to tier four by the middle of next month, roughly. 
So that is a very <clears throat> rational way to use vaccines if the aim is to reduce mortality. Um, and I, I, I think that that was a, a very firm decision that was made not by the government, but by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization. Um, in, an alternative is to try to interrupt transmission. And that, um, according to some of the analyses done by some of Stephen's colleagues, um, can be optimized by, by going for a younger age group, people who are actually transmitting the virus. And if you've got more vaccine, it makes more sense to, to go for that group as well. Um, in terms of vaccines for children, so the studies are, are ongoing. We still don't really know about the, the efficacy of vaccines in children. They, they're presenting with very peculiar um, effects. I mean, there's, there's, there's inflammatory syndrome, which is sometimes seen in children. It's quite rare, but it's a quite remarkable one. Just this morning, my daughter, who's a general practitioner, sent me a picture of um, the toes of a 12-year-old. And these toes are all going blue and black. And her brother had the same. So this was the only sign they had of COVID is that their toes were going blue and black. Now, they will recover. This is something which is co commonly seen, but this isn't something we see with other viruses like influenza or um, other common cold viruses. It's a, it's a quite remarkable uh, diversity of, of sim symptoms. And over time, it may be that we'll move from targeting mortality to targeting these other forms of disease, including, we hope, long COVID, which we very much hope and do anticipate will be prevented by vaccination and often is seen in younger people. Yeah, I think we're almost getting to the time where we can uh, ask you questions about long COVID because it's been long enough that you have a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of cases showing up. I don't know how long, how, how much you're seeing of that prevalence. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very worrying situation. I mean, so for, ev for everyone who sadly dies, there will be several who, whose lives are uh, well changed in, in the medium to long term by the, uh, an incomplete recovery. And I think one of the remarkable things that this, is, and this outbreak is teaching us is what diverse diseases, which we often don't know the, the cause of, uh, may be actually triggered by viral infection. So it's... Um, we're learning so much medicine from this and seeing so much bizarre presentation. Um, I mean, I think a, a thing which is a particular concern are the neuropsychiatric delayed effects, not just lethargy and malaise, but, but some quite significant um, psychiatric problems which are occurring in some people, not only related to hospitalization, but perhaps more specifically to, to this virus. There's so much we don't know and so much mm. which, uh, which we're still learning. I'll keep up the good work. There's uh, speaking of uh, interesting cases. Have you seen people who've been very much in touch with and and around infected people who themselves never uh, show infection? Yes. And That's another true. question from John Moulton about any more promising drugs. Uh, okay. Use. Yes. So quickly on those two. So we we actually published a study in the journal Science just a few months ago about. Um, in uh, deliberately exposing volunteers to another common cold virus called RSV. And about half the volunteers that we squirt this virus up the nose of um, don't develop infection. And we've been trying to unpick what it is about those people that makes them resistant or susceptible. And it turns out that it really is to do with the state of the nasal mucosa. If the, if the lining of the nose is in a state of readiness to defend against bacteria, then it seems that they get much worse um, colds. But um, I, I won't explain that in too much detail, but it's, it's a really interesting and important question. And many people who cohabit with people with COVID are actually not getting infected. And we think a similar process may be happening. Um, in terms of other drug treatments, so a lot of treatments which were thought rational and, and possibly effective have now been shown not to work. Um, and I think it's particularly important to discover that because then we won't be treating people unnecessarily with drugs which potentially are harmful. Um, so things which, which maybe are going to work, particularly if given very early, are the antibodies that, um, that Wendy Barclay referred to. So either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies. So serum from people who've recovered 
if it's given very early in the first three days of disease before they really get um, the, the more serious complications, that seems to work. It doesn't work if you give it too late. Um, and an, an intriguing one, which was just reported in the last few days um, in terms of a press release, but confirming some other data, is colchicine, which is a, a drug which is used to inhibit um, um, uh, cell division. And so it's a, it's a drug which is used in some rheumatoid conditions. It's very cheap, and that looks pretty promising as well with large reductions in the need for um, mechanical ventilation and death, but we're still waiting to see the full results from that. I think we're all, um, all fairly excited about the, the, the uh, RNA vaccines and uh, the fact that we've been able to use them now in this case um, is really very promising. Uh, there are a number of questions about that and whether um, that bodes well for other diseases, even HIV AIDS um, or other uh, epidemics that, uh, of using this type of a vaccine. I don't know whether Wendy wants to comment on that. Well, no. I think one of, from my point of view as someone who's worked on influenza virus for the last 20 or 30 years, <clears throat> I think these will really transform what we can do with influenza um, because we'll be able to respond so much more quickly to changes in viruses that evolve in this way and update themselves every year. Um, and the other, the other big question I think that we don't yet know with the mRNA vaccines is how many different strains could we mix together in one vaccine? Because with influenza, we're limited by the, prote the amount of protein we can get into somebody's arm, basically. And so we can't give very multivalent vaccines, but it might be that we can give more. And that could be very useful, both because it's very difficult to predict which exact virus is going to emerge, so you could sort of hedge your bets. Um, also, because you could begin to perhaps immunize people against um, animal strains of flu or animal strains of coronavirus, which haven't yet emerged and, and build up some immunity in the population already. So I think the, you know, the, the whole field of vaccinology is completely opened up and it's like a revolution. And I think the next few years will really uh, change the way that we use these vaccines. Let me uh, make a, we could have a little bit of a discussion. Several people have asked about the vaccine, uh, the self-amplifying RNA vaccine that uh, Robin Shattuck and his colleagues have been developing. And I think that that also is extremely promising uh, as a self-amplifying vaccine. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it replicates itself. Uh, Robin says, let your muscles do the work, do the heavy lifting. And, um, and he's now turning to the fact that it is such an agile platform. Uh, if we need a new vaccine for a new mutation or a new strain, uh, he can be ready and do that. He can also help with booster vaccines and there are reasons that RNA vaccines might be good for boosters on top of other types of vaccines that maybe Wendy can explain. And he's also, I think, very excited about the promise of a, of a vaccine that's better at higher temperatures or more stable at higher temperatures. So, uh, Wendy, I don't know if you want to comment. You work uh, closely and down the hall from, uh, from Robin's group. Well, I, I know that Robin's already ordered the, the strains for the updated variants, uh, you know, to begin that proof of principle work, which has to be done, which is to show that if you update with your mRNA, your self-amplifying RNA, you'll, you'll protect. Um, and you're right, the, you know, his platform is incredibly agile in the same way that the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA platforms are agile. Um, th there was a question, I think, in the chat about sort of the fragility of these um, vaccines. And I think that is key, particularly when we think about rolling out vaccines to different parts of the world. And one of the big challenges now is to work out how to deliver uh, the RNA. The RNA has to be sort of placed inside what's called a nanoparticle or, or a delivery particle. And so we haven't got all the problems solved yet. There's a, lot, there's a lot to work out and we need to get better at making RNA vaccines which are temperature stable, stable and that deliver themselves very efficiently into those muscles to start doing that heavy lifting. So, so it's very intense research at the moment, but we're, we're right, right there at the boundaries of it. Someone had also asked about uh, hesitancy to take a vaccine and, and we'd certainly worry about that. And, and you know, what fraction of the population uh, taking up vaccines is deemed 
uh, good and making a, a difference and, and how we can perhaps all do our part in supporting uh, people's decision to take the vaccine. Yeah, so could I make a comment on that? So I think it is a very, very major problem. And uh, for example, amongst um, uh, the uh, teams looking after patients with psychiatric disease, the vaccine uptake rate can be as low as 10%. We've seen that in influenza. Um, there are some other groups that are very resistant. Midwives, we often have trouble convincing them that vaccines are a good idea, particularly for pregnant women. Um, we need to really understand this better. I think there's an, another um, issue is that sometimes you can almost declare your um, your allegiance to um, to a particular group by declaring your vaccine hesitancy or your or your rejection of vaccines or rejection of science. And the the sort of psychology and sociology of vaccine hesitancy is so important. I think. We've all tried to do our best to get the message out by any means we can about just how good and effective these vaccines are. And I do think that is so important that we do communicate the science widely and that we use uh, the media to communicate to as many members of the public and also to enter you know, a really serious dialogue with people who might be opinion leaders within communities uh, where vaccine uptake is, is very, very low. But I think the more people can see that vaccines are saving lives, the easier it will be to get that message out. Great, well, thank you. And and I think I'd like to go uh, once more around. We're, we're a little bit over time, but it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, perhaps each of you might have a piece of good news to, uh, to end our discussion on, and then I'll sum up with some good news. Um, it, so yeah, I'll I'll jump in. I'll echo Peter's uh, last comment a little bit. I think that you know we are the uh, the mRNA vaccines are incredible, and the uptake levels we're seeing in age groups in the UK are are fantastic. So I think that there's been an awful lot of talk about exit strategies for this, but if we can get very very high levels of coverage in those age groups, I think um, I think you know we do have a chance of of getting back to a, a more normal life quite quickly. So that's 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 my optimistic point to end on. Wendy? Well, yeah, the, the less chance we give the virus to generate its variants, the better we'll handle we'll have. So, um, you know, grasping on Stephen's pieces of hope, uh, if, if we can just hang on in there and adhere to our social distancing that little bit longer and get the prevalence down, then I think there's a good chance that that uh, the virus won't have such a good good route for, for getting those variants, and that'll buy us at least a window to gear up and, and be ready. So, um, yeah, I think it is all about hanging on in there, and, and we're we're on the way. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think my my sort of good news is the the way in which there's been such a dawning of of optimism about the use of similar vaccine technologies, as Wendy was saying, was also uh, such a, a lot of insights we're gaining into diseases through studying this, um, this pandemic. So many things we are finding out which will be of great use in the future in how we, we treat other diseases, future pandemics, um, and understand inflammatory conditions and, and, and so on. I think it's it's a it's been a very exciting time to see so much interest in science from the public and so much interest in immunovirology from the scientific community more widely. Well, let me let me close on a similar note that I think the good news is we have fantastic people like uh, like Peter and Wendy and Stephen uh, working on this, and they took their research and and focused immediately on um, COVID and how to understand it. This was the found, based on a foundation of years of fundamental research supported by government, supported by philanthropy and supported by um, many people and, and through a lot of dedication. And uh, I think it's, it's fantastic that going forward, um, we're going to make a continued big difference in the world uh, through our Institute of Infection, our containment level three laboratories that Wendy spoke about, and the kinds of collaborations that these colleagues have uh, with their different backgrounds and disciplines 
going all the way from the computer to the bedside. Um, and our School of Public Health, which is pulling it together uh, through the Jamil Institute and the MRC Center. So I'm just really optimistic that um, science and fundamental research and the ability to take that research immediately into action for a major problem like this uh, can have a, make a big difference. So I wanna thank you all my dear colleagues as well as uh, everyone who joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.